Break out of the chaos. Hi, business owners. Phase three. Woohoo! But do your customers know you're back? Well, that's where the Clarence Bug Show and Pelican Broadcasting can help. Right now, we've got great rates on advertising packages to help you get the word out. Shoot me an email at bugsclarence at gmail.com. Or better yet, call me up. I'd love to talk with you. 225-485-6839. Let's get together and make Phase 3 the best it can possibly be. Hello, guys. It's Debbie. It's time. I've got a brand new location. 10510 Airline Highway, Baton Rouge, next to After 5 Tuxedos. We have the perfect spot to get all your wedding and formal wear needs. Come see our one-of-a-kind name brand and get great prices. With 30 years experience, the best customer service anywhere. It's Debbie's Bridal, Airline Highway, Baton Rouge. See you soon. Getting a letter from the IRS that you owe back taxes can be scary, but it doesn't have to be. Call Go Tax Resolution in Lafayette at 337-420-1040 today. We'll help stop garnishments, levies, and seizures immediately. With over 35 years of dealing directly with the IRS, our team of local professionals will help you pay the least amount possible. So if you owe back taxes to the IRS, you need help. Call the tax professionals at Go Tax Resolution in Lafayette at 337-420-1040. Your go-to tax relief. If y'all had any idea at all what goes on behind the scenes. Hello and welcome to week eight of the Roger Cador Show. Clarence Bugs, along with the coach. Coach, uh, uh, we, we got to stop meeting like this, man. I, I, I'm getting tired of trying to keep track. I'm tired of the numbers. And, and I try to keep it in perspective, understanding that actually I'm blessed to have witnessed so many greats ply their trade over the years. But along with that comes the reality of the cycle of life. And we are in, for us baby boomers, the cycle of life where we witness those that came before us and some along with us pass along to their next existence. You and I have gone over the last few months now down the list of Hall of Famers, particularly in Major League Baseball, um, that are no longer with us. And this past weekend, we added yet another to the list in the form of none other than hammering Hank Aaron. You have some unique... Um, Revelation, not really revelations, experiences with, with, with Hammer. When you hear the name Hammer and Hank Aaron, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, a genuine, humble person, mm -hmm. a, good, a, a great mentor for so many people. And that's really what I think of him. Mm -hmm. I don't really think, I know you hit a bunch of home runs. Right. We all know that. Right. But fortunate for me, I got to know him a little better mm -hmm. than the hammer hitting 755 home run. Right. I got to know him on a personal level where we could discuss a lot of things that's not even baseball related. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the most beautiful aspect of me having that relationship with him. When you would get the opportunity to talk with him, and one thing I admire about you is your respect for individuals. You have a time-tested and perfectly suited barometer where when you're in a company of individuals that, that, that have achieved monumental things, you respect their privacy, you understand the type of person that they are, so you typically don't, quote, go there with them like many of us fans would. What are some of the things you and Hammer and Hank would talk about over the years? You know, you know, and another thing we didn't talk about, which was at the time was really bad, mm -hmm. was the racism yeah. that we both faced. Right. Him much more than me. Oh, yeah. But we certainly faced it. Right. But we only touch on that very little. Hammer and I talked about 
forging a way how we could make things better mm -hmm. for the next generation of young black people. Right. And we we talked about those kind of things. Mm -hmm. We laughed about things. Right. I mean, that was a relaxing moment because we talked about uh, the Southern and FAMU because right. it was a big rivalry in football uh -huh. and the bands. Yeah. You see, we talked about that kind of thing because many members of his first wife, who was from Jacksonville, they went to FAMU. Mm -hmm. His son went to FAMU. Mm -hmm. And so we talk and, about and, that. And, and for white people, that's Florida A&M oh. University, FAMU. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't hold it against me. I'm having fun. <laughs> so we, we, we discussed those kind of things. And he had a big concern that that there wasn't many people with, who looked like him in baseball who were making decisions. Right. And he felt that the f lack of those people was going to hinder baseball, and he nailed it mm -hmm. because it did come back to haunt him. I said all along they should have made Hank a, an ambassador yep. for baseball. And yep. what it would have done, it would have encouraged many, many more African-American kids to play baseball mm -hmm. back in the 70s when they should have done it. Yeah. You, you look at the fact that uh, when he – was closing in on Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. Uh, death threats, lots of uh, racial animosity was hurled his way, but he always managed to handle that with class and with dignity. That takes a special person to do that, doesn't it? Oh, very special. Well, he was special. Mm -hmm. You know, there are only a few can answer the calling to be in that situation and mm -hmm. still produce. Yeah. And not right. even said, you can't even remember him saying one word right. against those people right. who were doing ugly things to him. He didn't say one word. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the old adage is pressure will bust the pipe. I don't know if I could have held up, you know, in, in, in a maybe in one week moment, you know, I, I may pull a Joey Bell on him and, you know, want to moon the crowd or something, but, yeah. but it truly is a special person that can do that. If I could say one more thing, the other thing that got me much closer to Hammer was that I played for his brother, Tommy Aaron. That's right. Tommy Aaron and I got to be personal friends also. Wow. So that was a, a really, I hadn't mentioned much about Tommy, but I'm telling you, uh, we were connected. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I remember as a young skinny kid playing and Tommy was coaching uh, a double A. Right. And they wanted to send me to, to single A and he was fighting them to say, I want that guy. I want that guy on my <laughs> right. team. So right. I'll never forget it. He would come to our, because in spring training you got several fields right. where they have different teams practicing. Mm -hmm. And he would venture out there to see me play. And he said, boy, you got it. I like everything about you, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wanted to just throw that in because I don't want to leave that member of the family out because we were, both of those men, we were close. You mentioned uh, his greatness as far as handling the pressure, uh, being able to express himself without succumbing to that pressure. Obviously, there were some things inside of Hank Aaron that precluded his greatness. Were, were there any other traits of greatness that you noticed about him early on before he became the legend in baseball that we all know? Well, or, or, the, and, and I guess what I'm asking is, does he fit in that mold with the certain people that achieve certain things you know when you meet them this guy's gonna be great he's humble he's hungry uh he's a team player uh, and i gotta think to reach the pinnacle that he did hammer had to be a possessor of all those traits let me tell you the bible speaks about a man like hammer about being a floor mat for mm -hmm. everyone else mm -hmm. you see how many people who was great and achieved what he was wouldn't be Say, you better do this for me. You better do this. Right, right. Or be bitter. Or be bitter. And he wasn't. He mm -hmm. told me a story about Willie Mays. They were playing an all-star game maybe in 65, 66. Don't hold me on the year. Right. And Willie Mays came to the park and told the manager, 
whoever that man is, I don't know if it's Leo <laughs> right. the Lib de Rocha. He right. said, you better put me in the leadoff spot, and I'm not coming out or I'm not playing. <laughs> what? He laughed at that. He laughed. Right. He thought it was the most hilarious thing that Willie Mays told the manager where he wanted to hit, and right. the manager could not take him out of the lineup. Wow. And Hammer would never have done that. That goes to show you Willie Mays is a little different than – than him, but they yeah. were both great players. Yeah. April 8th, 1974. What did Hammer and Hanks eclipsing of the record, what did it mean to baseball and to America? Well, it, it shows that anything can happen in America if you stay the course. Mm -hmm. There are going to be obstacles. Right. And he faced a lot of them, but he got it done. And he broke a record, and America became a better place because of that. Yep. Marty, is that uh, – Yeah, it is. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and get this break out of the way. When we come back, we've got a very special guest that will join us for today's edition of The Roger Cato Show. Stay close. Got termites? Get Premier Pest. PremierPestServices.com Hey, Coach Roger Kador here. There's something about teamwork that brings the best out in any business. When I need a tow, I call Roadrunner Towing. Roadrunner's four generations strong and homegrown right here in Baton Rouge. Thanks, Coach. There's no job too large or too small. Call Roadrunner for quick, reliable, exceptional service. We don't want an arm and a leg. We just want your toes. And remember, take time each day to be a blessing to someone. Thank you. Looking to get some keys made, locks rekeyed, or a wide variety of new and used safe? Then look no further than the trusted choice of African Safe and Lock. Conveniently located off of Government Street in Mid City, Baton Rouge. Trust the expert locksmith at Alfred for all of your residential, commercial, and industrial lock and safe needs. Trusted by Baton Rouge and me, Roger Kadar, to protect what is yours since 1946. Surprise! Something good has finally happened in 2020. Yours truly, The Clarence Bug Show, gets to be with you every day of the week. That's right, 11 to 12 every weekday. And, of course, The Exiles right in front of yours truly from 10 to 11, yours truly 11 to 12. So now it's appointment viewing five days a week here on The Pelican. The Clarence Bug Show, the only thing missing is you. From appetizers, pasta dishes, and entrees, La Contea takes pride in preparing all the Italian cuisine we know you love. Enjoy live music every Thursday through Saturday from 6 to 9, happy hour weekdays from 3 to 6, and brunch on Sundays from 11 to 2, as well as dinner portion-sized lunch specials for under $10. Visit our website to view our menu and book a party or meeting in our large banquet room. Once you try La Contea, your Italian dining will change forever. Caught spiders. Premier Pest Services. Welcome back to segment two of today's edition of the Roger Kador Show. We have been uh, so very blessed and fortunate over the last eight weeks uh, to spend some time with some individuals that have made some monumental contributions, not only uh, to sports in America, but particularly to one that is near and dear to the hearts of both Roger Kador and myself. Talking about the thinking man's game and the game of baseball. We are, again, fortunate today to have in our midst an individual that uh, I, I can always tell that you're never lying to me, Coach, because when we call these folks, the warmth that exudes through the phone 
is certainly genuine. If you would be so kind as to let our viewers at home know who joins us for this segment of the Roger Cador Show. Yeah, Clarence, we're fortunate to have on the line Jeff Hickson, who is the CEO of Major League Baseball Alumni Association. Major League Baseball players, players alumni. Alumni. I yeah. didn't want to mess it up, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but How do you, you know. fit all that? The first one, Coach. Huh? <laughs> you wouldn't be the first one. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of letters in that one. That's right. A few letters get left out or added, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jeff. You know, you and I, through a phone call, you and I didn't know each other, and there was a phone call from a Billy North, who played many years in the big league. I think he won two or three. World Series championship with Oakland A's, played with Reggie Jackson, Sam, Sal Bando, Riley Fingers, Vital Blue, wow. Catfish Hunter, on and on and on. So he played with a lot of great people. And he had a fight with Reggie in the clubhouse. You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> He's not the only one that can say that either. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, Jeff. But, you know, our relationship grew out of that. And we did a lot of wonderful things together. I think I, we did four, fifth, 13 fundraisers here in Baton Rouge, raised a lot of money for Southern University and Little League Baseball. And you are really in the trenches helping kids from all over the world. Mm -hmm. You've sent uh, players all over. I want you to talk about some of the things that you have done or, and are still doing to grow the game of baseball and help people. Absolutely, Coach. Well, I looked it up while we were uh, while we were talking. Uh, it was 2006 was our first event together, so it was uh, it was a while ago. So yeah, we've been we've been uh, pals for a long time, and we've done a lot of good things together. That's true. Um, we got together as as Coach said with Billy North, who's one of our former players. Uh, yeah, and the organization that that I belong with is is Major League Baseball Players Alumni. We've been around since 1982. Uh, we promote the sport of baseball, we raise money for charity, and we address the unique needs of the former player. That's three big things that we uh, are on a daily day uh, basis that takes up all of our time. Now, I'll say how we promote the sport of baseball at the coach's point exactly. We do free youth clinics for kids all over the world. Uh, and we do uh, those every place and any place we can get some people to come out. Uh, it's all free to the kids. Last year uh, was a weird year, as everybody knows. Uh, 2020 was one of those years that, that nobody uh, wants to talk about, but hope, hopefully never see again. Normally, we would do 185 free clinics for kids in uh, about 15 or 16 countries a year. Wow. And during that time, we'll see about 20, 21,000 kids. Uh, when we're in the Caribbean, uh, we go down there, and every time we do a clinic down there, we take a bunch of equipment and leave it there because those kids don't have access to the stuff we do here in the States. So we'll take bats, balls, catcher's gear, and the whole nine and leave it down there for those kids to play with. Um, it's, it's real easy to be a, a hero down there when you bring brand new equipment. Let me say it that way. Uh, but our goal is not only to teach the sport of baseball, but it's also to, to promote it. And in other words, you know, we've got all these former players that we put out there as positive role models. Uh, each one of our clinics includes a life skills station, which is, uh, you know, work hard, stay in school, listen to your parents, and do, uh, do all the work you're supposed to do and make yourself a better citizen as well. So that's to promote the sport. Um, that's a, that's a big-time big draw, what we, uh, what we do. We also raise money for charities. Coach Kadar mentioned the fact that we raise so much money for Southern University's baseball program over the years. And we do that by bringing former players out to stuff just like that, dinners, um, golf tournaments, celebrity golf tournaments, sporting clays events, fishing tournaments, whatever you can do with foreign players we probably have done or are currently doing. We've raised over $80 million doing stuff like that over the years, and we're pretty proud of that number. Uh, last thing we do is, is uh, take care of the foreign players. So it's uh, pension and health care. Once they leave the, uh, the game as a current player, they're no longer represented by the Major League Baseball Players uh, Union, so therefore they slide to us, and we look out for them as far as uh, uh, negotiations for collective bargaining and things of that sort. So we try to take care of them that way as much as we can as they join the fraternity uh, of the alumni. Well, Jeff, I know you do. I was in Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico, about f six years ago, and I ran into a former older major league player who was in health, had some health issues, had no insurance, and I made the call to you. 
and you yeah. responded by immediately helping that gentleman get some insurance. I appreciate you for doing that. Absolutely. Well, you know, we see more people than anybody in the baseball world because we are the alumni, and, and a lot of people come through our, our ranks on a regular basis. We've got over 9,000 uh, current and former players that are members of this organization. It is the fraternity. No one looks out for, for the guys like we do. Uh, we have a sister organization within the family of baseball called the Baseball Assistance Team. They are out of New York in the Major League Baseball office. And uh, between the two of us, we see a whole lot of people, and Baseball Assistance Team is there set up as a foundation to take care of those indigent players or the guys that, that need little assistance. And a lot of there's not a week, unfortunately, that goes by that we don't send somebody to the baseball assistance team. So we're hopefully going to you know cut that down a little bit by by providing more opportunities so the so the former players don't get into in the need of, of having to call that. But um, so far they are a great organization and done a lot of good things for a lot of people. Jeff, I've been uh, so fortunate in my broadcast career to host TV shows for. Hall of Fame coaches across the spectrum, basketball, baseball, football uh, in particular. And as a result of that, I've had the opportunity over the years to cover and take part in many fundraisers uh, for, of, of various levels. But one thing that's always stood out to me, Jeff, about the baseball family is the true feeling of family and and how they bond together over the experience of playing baseball particularly at the major league level is there something intrinsically embedded in baseball that you can tell that lends itself to those who play the game being more of a family as opposed to other guys that once they finish their NFL career or NBA career, you don't see that kind of love and affection and outreach like you do in baseball. Is there something inherent in the game itself that leads to that? I think that you're exactly right, Clarence. I think baseball is different than all the other big, big sports for a lot of reasons. Mostly because it's not a helmet sport, so you have one-on-one, -on -one, you know, face time, so to speak, whether you're at the game or on TV. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that sets it apart. It's also a game that's not timed. Mm -hmm. It's a very quote-unquote relaxed atmosphere. Right. Before the game, during batting practice, there's a lot of interaction. Again, under normal circumstances, without the pandemic, interaction with the fans and the players by the dugout interaction with people down the field, uh, the sponsors, the, the ties that all the, the things they do pre-game, right. and even post-game. There's a lot of that there as well. When the former players get out of the game, they they've always have seemed to be a little more um, involved in their local charities and their local communities, and there's only so many of them. Ultimately, there's only 19,000 guys that have ever played the game at the big league level, all, all right. the way back to Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb. Uh -huh. So... If you're going to talk about a small fraternity, baseball is that. And they're very uh, understanding of the fan fandom and the fans that they, they grew up with, mm -hmm. uh, not only when they were watching the game, but when they were playing the game. A lot right. of the guys that have left the game have settled in the cities that they played in. Mm -hmm. They'll always be a, a celebrity in that community. No matter what happens, they're the guys that at one point or another played on that field and everybody loves them for it. What are you most proud of of your 20-plus years with the Major League Players Alumni Association? I think just making you know, such a dent in, in the community of the youth baseball, uh, being able to, to get the former and some now current players you know, back plugged into the game on that grassroots level uh, in conjunction with raising money for so many worthwhile causes. The Children's Hospital, the National Kidney Foundation, the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation, all these organizations that could always use a little help to, to fill their programs out. Uh, we're here to do that and have done that for a lot of years, and I think that's very important. And plus, you know, taking care of the boys. Uh, no one's, as I mentioned earlier, no one's going to look out for the former player uh, like their own fraternity. And just being able to have a relationship over these 25 years that I've been here with so many great guys. And, and so many guys that you know could use a little help here and there, and being able to provide uh, resources for them is, has been very rewarding. 
Also, Jeff, you, you give a lot of young people opportunity. I know you were looking for someone, and I had a young intern, and I recommended her to you. And you hired her, and she's doing a fantastic job. One of the things that you were able to do with these young people, if spring training and we didn't have COVID-19, you would send them out to spring training and do a lot of things. Tell me some of the things that they would do in, at spring training. Absolutely, Roger. I think the key is, um, in normal circumstances, we have three classes of interns that come through, spring, summer, and fall. And it's usually one or two, depending on the, the workload. But we pull from all over the world, and these people come up and, and spend time on every one of our programs and get them grassroots information and um, experience in all aspects and facets of the alumni. And we always tell them, you know, it's not so much what you come out of this thing with that you're good at, because we know that, but if you come out of this experience of internship with us that things you hate and you're bad at, <laughs> that might be more <laughs> beneficial and, and long-term <laughs> for you. <laughs> and that's okay, too. But we do have, we have uh, for-profit entities under our nonprofit, and that's Major League Alumni Marketing. And that's where our, our fundraising opportunities for the, for the former and current player live. So we have our memorabilia program over there. We have uh, exclusive athletes like Mike Trout and Jacob. Uh, we had Jacob DeGrom, Buster Posey, um, you know, guys, names you know, and we have them exclusively in our memorabilia department. So when those interns go out to spring training, we set up auction tables at the uh, spring training sites, and we'll raise money for, uh, you know, the MWAM side, which is Major League Alumni Marketing, put money in our pocket over there to hand down to the guys to sign stuff and do that kind of thing. But also 25% of each one of those auctions goes right back to the team's foundation. So the guys, you know, our former uh, uh, players get money to sign the stuff. The foundations get money to uh, when we sell the stuff. And the interns get all kinds of experience of hands-on dealing with people setting up uh, auction tables and, and the like. So that's one of the main things we do. And one of the greatest things you and I have laughed about over the years, Dave Winfield. How about Dave Winfield? Isn't he a wonderful guy? We've I laughed a lot a about it. Time. Yes, Dave is awesome. Dave and Dave's been around the game for a long, long time, and and he still, you know, works for the Players Association. He's very involved in in doing whatever he can for the game of baseball as a whole. But he works on a regular basis for the for the Players Association, which is the current players. And he's in and out of that office in New York all the time, and and out on the road doing as much as as much good things as he can because he knows this sport is so important to so many people. Jeff, if you had not been doing this for the last 25 years, what would have Jeff Hickson been doing? <laughs> that, is, that is a great question. And, and Coach, Coach and I talk about this all the time. I was born and raised in central Illinois as a farm kid. I was a farm kid uh, all the way up through college. And my, my parents still lived there, and, and my dad finally retired from farming. He wanted me to be a farmer for a long time, I mean, and not like animals farming, but like grain farming. Right. And it's still a great place to do that, but you know, that was uh, you talk about the gamblers that sit at the tables at the uh, World Series of Poker, they right. got nothing on a farmer. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good, Jeff. <laughs> good. That's right. <laughs> well, Jeff, hey, I know you're a busy man. We want to say thanks for taking out a few minutes to come and share some wonderful experience with our audience so they could get a better idea of what the uh, Players Alumni Association does uh, for their former players and communities and organizations. So you all do a lot of things that people don't know about. One, one other quick thing. How can people find out more, Jeff, about the great work that your organization is doing? Absolutely, Clarence. Thank you for leading me into that. I was going to go right there. Uh, one more thing I need to add, and I, I was neglecting doing this. My, our president is Brooks Robinson, the former third baseman of the Orioles. Yes. He's been the president for uh, as long as I've been here and almost the entire organizational life. And Brooks is one of the best guys on the planet. He loves what we do. He's so proud of the way the growth has happened and all the things we've been able to do, not only for the current and former player, but all the charities and the kids that we've taught the game to. So I, I at least want to mention the president before I hang up. And you can check us out at, at baseballalumni.com. That's our website. Uh, everything that you want to know about what we do is there. And, uh, and check out the schedule as uh, we might be coming to your town. 
Oh, Jeff, you've done it again. You hit a grand slam. <laughs> I'm just happy to be in the box, Coach. There you go. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thanks for sharing the time with us, okay? Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the time. Okay, All Jeff. All right, bye. take care, and Happy New Year to you. A uh, couple of quick things. One, um, and I, I, I should have told him this, Brooks is my favorite all-time Major League Baseball player. Um, I was in a horrific motorcycle accident uh, in ninth grade and got to watch the entire World Series because I was hobbled with a cast for six months. Uh, so all I could do was watch TV. Yeah. And talk about gave me a life-changing perspective on the position of third base. It was amazing. But, but something else that, uh, that Jeff just said struck me. I had the privilege of working spring training for two years with uh, This Week in Baseball, TWIB, mm -hmm. uh, as we call it. And listening to him talk about the interns and, and the exposure that they get through Major League Baseball and particularly through spring training, um, when you have the opportunity to see these guys, these big leaguers, up close and some of the things that they can do with a baseball and a bat and a glove, it gives you a whole new appreciation for the game that you can't get parked in front of the television right. on, on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, I, it, it's something, if you love this country, if you love the game, if you love people and organized sports in general, every American should have the opportunity to take in spring training. And uh, it just gives you a whole new appreciation for the game and the personalities that are involved that you can't get anywhere else. <laughs> I mean, it's, I know it. So you, you're singing to I'm the choir. I'm preaching to the choir. There you go. Preaching well, to singing. the choir. <laughs> you're singing. My dad. Right, you play piano. I got the organ. <laughs> and we'll go from there. We need to take a break. We are long overdue. We'll do so. We'll get that out of the way and talk some more sports right here where you've got it. Week 8 of the Roger Cador Show. Stay close. Getting a letter from the IRS that you owe back taxes can be scary, but it doesn't have to be. Call Go Tax Resolution in Lafayette at 337-420-1040 today. We'll help stop garnishments, levies, and seizures immediately. With over 35 years of dealing directly with the IRS, our team of local professionals will help you pay the least amount possible. So if you owe back taxes to the IRS, you need help. Call the tax professionals at Go Tax Resolution in Lafayette at 337-420-1040. Your go-to tax relief. Hi, I'm Hurricane Betsy Barnes. And I'm Dr. Kay Siller with The Rocket Right Show. We are two busy blondes on the go showing off life in Louisiana. Watch us on Pelican Sports Network. And talk 107.3 FM. Check local listings for times. Hello, guys. It's Debbie. It's time. I've got a brand new location. 10510 Airline Highway, Baton Rouge, next to After Five Tuxedos. We have the perfect spot to get all your wedding and formal wear needs. Come see our one-of-a-kind name brand and get great prices. With 30 years experience, the best customer service anywhere. It's Debbie's Bridal, Airline Highway, Baton Rouge. See you soon. Surprise, something good has finally happened in 2020. Yours truly, the Clarence Bug Show gets to be with you every day of the week. That's right, 11 to 12 every weekday. And, of course, the exiles right in front of yours truly from 10 to 11, yours truly 11 to 12. So now it's appointment viewing five days a week here on the Pelican, the Clarence Bug Show. The only thing missing is you. Break out of the chaos. Welcome back to week eight of the Roger Cador Show. Coach, let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, 
at the beginning of the college basketball season, LSU's Fighting Tigers came out of the gate smoking. Ran up a 5-0 and record in conference play, and everybody was talking about, oh, maybe the magic is back. Maybe the magic is back. Well, put the brakes on that puppy for just a minute, dropping three in a row now. All of a sudden, that 5-0 and dissipates, and you look up, and it's 5-3. and What do you tell a team after their first conference loss? Well, you know, the first conference loss is not, you don't, there is no, uh, where you panic. Right. It's, it's a loss. Right. You can get come back and win the next one. Uh-huh. And you will lose the next one. Right. Still no panic. Right. You just say, guys, we got to play better. Yeah. We are not executing up to our capability. But, then the third one, you just try to now try to find a way there you can start making adjustments. Mm-hmm. It's not as much as what you tell them. You're going to have to, as a coach, try to start figuring out what adjustments can we make right. to help them enjoy more success. When two of the three losses, the last two back-to-back, have both been in double digits, from a coaching standpoint, does that affect the adjustments that you try to make? If, if, you, if the personnel allow you to make adjustments, mm-hmm. see, that's going to be the next thing. Right. What with the personnel we have, how much adjustments can we make right. to get more production? Uh-huh. It may not be there. You mm-hmm. got me. Right. He may not be able to go more than six deep, even though he may have to go eight or nine. Right. And that's really because keep in mind he lost a lot of good players to the NBA oh, yeah. draft last year. Oh yeah. And it's tough. It's tough because LSU yet it's not Kentucky, uh-huh. and even Kentucky's having problems this year yeah and it's been yeah. an unusual year with COVID-19 we don't know how much that has affected mm-hmm. so many people with this particular LSU team it seems like it's either one extreme or the other it's either feast or famine is that something you can coach your way out of or is it something that you more have to play your way out of probably have to play your way out of it with some coaching mixed in Mm -hmm. in in helping making some minor adjustment right and in some cases maybe major but Mm -hmm. again to make major adjustment they turn on personnel right i mean yeah you know that's the only way you know and i don't know enough about his personnel to say what he can and can't do right lsu's defense really really shaky well, particularly for, for the last two games, giving up 93 and a half points a game last week. But defense is a mindset, isn't it? To some degree. More, more physical or more of a mindset? It could be or, physical. Or, or about 50-50. It could be, uh, you know, it could be some physicality there. I, if I had seen the team play... I can make better assessment. Right. Uh, you can teach a lot of things defensively, how to keep guys to anticipate being positioned. You got a film on a guy, take away his left or take away his right. Uh-huh. Those kind of things, if you, you know what I'm saying? Right. If you right. have those kind of things, you can defensive, you mm-hmm. can do it. So, mm-hmm. you know, I just don't know what they're doing. Uh, but the, the conference is always tougher than oh, yeah. the conference schedule. Oh, yeah. So that's really maybe more of a reality. They're not in the elite five teams in the conference. How easy is it to try and do too much from the coaching in and from the playing in when you've got a team with this much potential that, according to some, they are obviously underperforming how how easy is it to try and do too much to write that ship who said they're under <laughs> who is saying that Claire? did y'all see the look just in? who said <laughs> who is saying that somebody who is writing something down uh, saying that they're underperforming it's social media coach it's social it's, media oh yeah. i forgot yeah. okay well yeah social media may say they're underperforming but again again they may not 
they just may need to find a little better uh, uh, continuity. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe finding one a guy or two can come off the bench can do some spark. Right. And a guy or two can say, I'm going to be the defensive stop on that guy. Right. I mean, you know, you, you got to find something uh-huh. to help offset what you're not doing good right now. Right. You're not playing good defense. Obviously, they're not shooting well either. So it's not just one. Uh-huh. It's both a part of the game. You, you look at the fact that, uh, and it's no secret, young people these days are a different breed from young people not so very long ago. Is dealing with things of this nature and understanding the nature of kids these days, is that why we don't see folks with the longevity, the likes of a Roger Kador, uh, Eddie Robinson, uh, Marino Chasm, uh, uh, folks that were legendary in their time and had been there for, is, is that one of the reasons where you see people more, more, more likely than not nowadays say, I don't need this crap, I'm going home, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of this. It, it, how much does that play into all of this? Yeah, Dale Brown lasts a long time and Skip mm-hmm. Berkman, yeah. they last a long time also. It's just, uh, it's just different. Uh, I was ready to go, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. with, it's, it's just, it's so, so different. And it's the parents. Yeah. You know, kids come from parents, so we can't say Good it's point. the kids they without including the they, parents. They, they didn't just pop up out the ground full grown. Somebody raised them. There you go. And we, whatever our kids are, we have to look and say, maybe because the parents didn't do a good job. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, you know, and I just think that, you know, and I admit I've fallen short as a parent, you know. Well, we all have. Yeah. yeah. We're human. So, but I'm, I will admit it. Right. There are people who won't admit it. <laughs> they will not admit that they are falling short and they are creating a monster. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Even at my son is 36, I'm telling him when, hey, son, you can't do that. This is, you need to consider doing this. I'm still trying to right. be a parent. Right. Well, that never stops. Never. But there are some people know that kids are doing wrong and will support it. Yeah. Yeah. You know. How many parents have called me about their son when I said, well, little Johnny didn't come to practice and he didn't give me an excuse. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to find an excuse. Yeah, but why are you giving me the excuse? Little Johnny didn't. You you don't play for me. Little Johnny plays for me. I said, you got to understand you're somewhere in Timbuktu (laughs) and little Johnny's here. He doesn't care about you all. No, no. It's all about little Johnny. And for those of you that doubt the authenticity of his statement, uh, God in his infinite wisdom designed his universe to run through the family. That's right. Young men are supposed to learn what it means to be a good father, a good husband, a good team player by watching their father. That's right. Young ladies are supposed to learn what it means to be a good mother, a good wife by watching and emulating their mother so before you reach for that cell phone and call the coach and want to get on his back you might want to consider what kind of product did you send him to work with from the beginning (gasps) yeah i said it you said said that claire you did it so well he's too too nice to tell you but i'll tell you you did it well (laughs) claire as you broke it down (laughs) final break of today's show marty We'll get her done. Marty's sitting over there like this looking at us. All right, final break. We get her done. We'll come back and wrap up week eight of the Coach Roger Cador Show. Stay close. Got termites? Get Premier Pest. PremierPestServices.com 
Looking to get some keys made, locks rekeyed, or a wide variety of new and used safe? Then look no further than the trusted choice of African Safe and Lock. Conveniently located off of Government Street in Mid City, Baton Rouge. Trust the expert locksmith at Alfred for all of your residential, commercial, and industrial lock and safe needs. Trusted by Baton Rouge and me, Roger Kadar, to protect what is yours since 1946. Surprise, something good has finally happened in 2020. Yours truly, The Clarence Bug Show, gets to be with you every day of the week. That's right, 11 to 12 every weekday. And, of course, The Exiles right in front of yours truly from 10 to 11, yours truly 11 to 12. So now it's appointment viewing five days a week here on The Pelican, The Clarence Bug Show. The only thing missing is you. Hey, Coach Roger Kador here. There's something about teamwork that brings the best out in any business. When I need a tow, I call Roadrunner Towing. Roadrunner's four generations strong and homegrown right here in Baton Rouge. Thanks, Coach. There's no job too large or too small. Call Roadrunner for quick, reliable, exceptional service. We don't want an arm and a leg. We just want your toes. And remember, take time each day to be a blessing to someone. Thank you. <laughs> Spiders. Premier Pest Services. Welcome back for the final segment of today's edition of the Roger Cador Show, week eight. Boy, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? It really does, Clarence. Let's uh, shift gears again. And uh, the entire HBCU sports world has been riveted um, by Jackson State's hiring of primetime, Neon Dion Sanders. I mean, there has been more hoopla more uh, focus, more ink, as we call it in the business, folks writing uh, about the goings-on at Jackson State. Last week, he announced the signing of his 12th FBS transfer. Guy hadn't coached a college game yet, but apparently he's doing something right to get this many kids to believe and what he's selling at Jackson State. Now, I'm not saying, I, I saw the look on your face. I'm not saying what he's selling. Uh, I'm not going there. Uh, I'm not going there. Uh, but, but, but as the, is the case with any coach, you, you're selling something. an idea. You're selling something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are we, as HBCU fans, and in this particular case, the SWAT, are we putting too many unrealistic apples in the basket too early on? With Dion? Yeah. No. I think this is really great. Well, yeah, I, 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 I really do too. think. D don't get me wrong, but there's a little nagging voice that says, okay, what happens if it's a flop? It really doesn't matter that it's, much. It's a win-win right no matter. No matter. You, it's about now. Remember, we live in the world. It's about now. And getting that spotlight on us on, when we need it. I'm telling you. So it's really, I just think this good. I, I read something on a wide receiver from uh, from from Florida. Mm -hmm. Could have been Ocala, Florida. I don't want to say. There, there's actually been one from each that has transferred. One from well, USC. Well, no, he's a high school kid. Oh, no, no, not star. thinking about him. He's a okay. four-star recruit. Okay. Decommit from uh, University of Florida. Uh -huh. He decommitted to come for Dion. Mm -hmm. And that, he said his mother wanted him to do that. He didn't want to do it until she said it. Right. But once she said it, he felt good about doing it. Right. He listened to his mother. Because the mother believes what Dion is selling. Mm -hmm. It's good for her son. Yeah. And why, why shouldn't he? Well, yeah. The mother coach is selling something. Yeah. He's selling, and he's selling something where 
Kids are going to have so much fun. It's just going to be, it's so wonderful, I think, Clarence. Mm -hmm. Whatever he's selling, the whole black nation is going to be able to be happy about it until he, they lose to him. But, right. Or right. If, they, if they're not able to beat him. But I just think it's good what he's selling is good because it's given, it's about hope, Clarence. Yeah. We live yeah. in a world where it's a, hope is important. And obviously there is a, a, a spillover <clears throat> effect, for lack of a better word, for HBCUs in general. For example, Alabama A&M last week announcing that they've landed two quarterbacks, both of whom had numerous offers from schools in Power Five conferences. So if nothing else, maybe the biggest benefit out of all of this is media, athletes, families, communities now starting to take another look at HBCUs and the possibilities that they offer? And some of these kids, are, even though they may be a three or four star, they may never play at those schools. True. And now they got an opportunity to play uh -huh. and, and develop. See, it doesn't matter where you play if you really can play. Right. You know, and right. I often tell people by Ricky Weeks, it was 2003 and he won what amount to the Heisman Trophy when he won the right. Golden Spikes Award. Uh -huh. It didn't matter that Ricky played at Southern. At Southern, yeah. He had the ability. Yeah. Now, fortunately, when I recruited Ricky, nobody could, thought he could play other than me and one other coach. Wow. You know, and, uh, and he just developed. It. But I just think it's when I read about what is happening at Jackson State, I get excited because mm -hmm. I just think that residual effect for other schools mm -hmm. because he can't take them all. You got me? Yeah. So yeah. they have to go somewhere else. I remember distinctly when I was hosting Eddie Robinson's uh, TV series for Grambling, and he would get kids that just had amazing athletic ability and could have gone anywhere. And I would ask him, Coach, how do you convince parents and kids to come to this little tiny school up in the red clay hills of Grambling, Louisiana, where there's nothing to be found for miles unless you go to Ruston or to Shreveport or, or Monroe. You, you're asking them to come to nothing. And he would always tell me, he said, Bugs, when I would sit in the living room with parents, I'd tell them, I don't have any money. Our facilities are not as great as some other schools facilities are, but I'll make you a promise. I can guarantee you that your son will be in class when he's supposed to be there. Your son will wear a tie, coat and tie when he travels, if I have to go in my pocket and buy it, and your son will be in church on Sunday. He said, that was all I had to say. And they would immediately grab the papers out of my hand and sign. It's a different day now, though, isn't it? Yeah, well, black kids are not, they had no opportunity other than the Grambling, Southern, mm -hmm. Florida a &M, Jackson State, back in those days. Right. So he could do that. Right. Telling a, a parent the kid <laughs> is going to church now, they give less. What makes you think? I'm an atheist. What yeah. makes you think my child want to go to you church on Sunday? You almost can't mention religion now. Yeah. It's almost amazing. Or politics. Or politics, one or the other. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. So I think that it's so different, Clarence. The recruiting spec, Eddie Robinson selling that today is not selling anything no. if he was alive. So yeah. it's all about facilities and TV and, and you know, I'm going pro. Yeah. And, and you know, there must be a lot to that because Broderick Fobbs, now head coach at Graham, to show you how time flies, I was hosting Eddie Robinson's TV show when Broderick Fobbs was the starting fullback for Grambling. And his, now this young his man. His daddy. No. It. No. When he was there, I was doing Eddie Robb's TV show. I interviewed Broderick. Really? At Grambling. Really? Okay. Yeah. I knew his daddy played that too. Right. No, I ain't that old coach. What you trying to do to me, man? <laughs> you see, 
You seem I to thought you looked like time. Alan. <laughs> I thought I was talking to no, Alan. No, when Broderick yeah. Fobbs played for really? Grambling, mm-hmm. I was hosting Coach Rob's yeah. TV show. That, right. That's how I got to know him. But just this week, and the show apparently, this guy's not going to lie to you, just this week, he pulled out of Alabama one of any number of four or five star recruits. Nick Saban was recruiting this young man, but he's going to Grambling to play for Broderick Fobbs, saying it felt like family, it felt like home, it felt like some place that I want to be. be. Yeah. Now, and now that's important. Oh, oh yeah. Now. We don't know if he would have ever touched a blade of grass <laughs> on the field in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Only God knows that and Nick Saban. But to be in the conversation with Nick Saban and say, little Nicky, thank you for the consideration, but I'm going to the Red Clay Hills of North Louisiana. That says a heck of a lot, Coach, about the job he's doing. Yeah, it says a lot. It says a lot more about the kid and their family, the mm-hmm. parents, mm-hmm. because they have to ultimately make that decision. True. You got to go in and sell them, uh-huh. and they got to buy what, what you're, you're selling. selling. Yep. And that's what it all comes down to. Yep. Uh, another quick observation, and, and I think that a lot of this is due to the renewed interest in HBCU sports now uh, that's due in large part to prime time going to Jackson State, North Carolina A and T. Did you run track, by the way? No, sir. Didn't? <laughs> no, I didn't. Okay. Um, North Carolina A and T, HBCU, historically black college and university, has logged in so far this track season the fastest four by hundred relay time in the nation. Really? All colleges included. And uh, I just wonder if they would have gotten that publicity without this renewed focus on HBCU sports, due in large part to Dion. Well, there it is. I think Dion had played a big part. But I think, too, historical black colleges and universities are realizing now they have to put information out. Yeah. See. People are not coming to do article on you. Right. You have to send them mm-hmm. information. Where's Where's Benny Thompson when you need him? Where is he now? You know. Yeah. Well, we don't want to be where he is. Oh no. Right. Well, now. unless he's up there. <laughs> in which case, I have no problem with that. But uh, BT was one of those guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alonzo Hardy Jr. W- right. was one of those guys uh, back in the day. Kevin Maine, I tell Kevin you, Mayne. because without Kevin Maine, Ricky Weeks could never have won. Uh huh. The Golden Spikes, Kevin Mann did a great yeah. job. Yeah, you got to have the folks that are dedicated to publicity and putting it out there. Uh, as we wrap up today's show, I, I intended to tell him, and you can tell him next time you talk to him, tell Jeff that um, you all would have been a great pair because with his dad wanting him to be a father and with your dad being a sharecropper, yeah. y'all would have made a heck of a pair, man. Y'all could have y'all could really put up one great farm or ranch. Be sure you tell him that I said that the next time you talk to him. Okay. That is going to put a wrap on week number eight of the Coach Roger Cador Show. It is uh, always a great time, and we certainly appreciate the opportunity to share some time with you and yours and hopefully give you a little different insight on some folks. On behalf of the coach and the crew, I'm Clarence Bugs. We'll see you next week. Till then, go Jags.